So that brings us then to uh, Africa, right? So uh, the first question here, we had someone ask, what, why did Europeans practice imperialism in Africa? What was the relationship between Christianity and imperialism? How were biological concepts of race and ideas of civilization used to justify imperialism in Africa? So uh, Europeans, uh, just like Americans in the Philippines, understood themselves as engaging in a civilizing mission. We're going to civilize Africans. Um, also, I'll give you some examples later on, but social Darwinistic ideas influenced the uh, accusation of Africa and African colonies. A large part of justifying imperialism was the idea of economics. We need African resources, like rubber, and we need to then, we can then sell them back. We'll make useful things out of what the Africans have and sell them back to the Africans. So we need markets, right? Um, there were also sometimes security concerns. Sometimes you wanted to take a particular piece of territory because it threatened, uh, if you didn't control it, it could threaten you. Um, you wouldn't be safe. There was also competition. So for example, there were pieces of land that like, you know, uh, Britain and France are famous rivals. So there would be one piece of territory that neither one wanted, but sometimes they'd want to take it so the other didn't get it, right? So the French would, would start take, trying to take over a piece of territory and the British were like, oh no, we want it. And then they get in a contest. Christianity was ambiguous. And I talked about that through uh, David Livingston. Remember, he's that Christian missionary who really wants to help Africans. He wants Africans to become Christians. He also wants to help them to learn more about Western civilization and its accomplishments. And he wants to end slavery. And all that's really good in, in many respects. The problem was, remember, he kind of looks down on Africans, right? Africans need saving. Their old religions aren't, aren't good enough. Their old civilization has problems. We need to come in and fix them, right? So Christianity is kind of ambiguous. And to give you another example, we talked about Alice Harris, this woman who is a missionary who tries to help the uh, people of the Congo by taking photographs of, of how they're being tortured to, sh to shame um, the king, uh, King Leopold of Belgium to treat them better. But I gave you an example. Okay, let's, I'm sorry, go back here. Right, and one example I like to give was about this guy, Cecil Rhodes, right? Uh, remember, David Livingston was an explorer. His exploration made it possible for other Europeans to come into uh, Africa. Um, and they're not always as nice as David Livingston, even though David Livingston had some problems. He did sincerely care about African people. Some people didn't. They were just in Africa in order to get resources to help their own country. Some were just there to get rich, like Cecil Rhodes. Right? Remember we watched the video clip about how he, because he wanted like the gold on Matabihi land, is going to get a bunch of guys together. I, and I, I say that, it's not an army, it's just a bunch of guys. He gets together, buys them machine guns, and they go take over that territory. Right? They go take over that territory. That's how cheap industrial powers got. Just this rich guy can go buy a bunch of guns. It's like Bill Gates buying a bunch of M1 Abram tanks and annexing Canada. <laughs> Okay, excellent. <laughs> Sorry. And remember, and I gave you this example, this terribly grammatic, I mean, grammatically, this is horrible. I was, I was very careful. I, I transcribed it correctly. Uh, the grammar mistakes are in the original. But he uses social Darwinism to justify this, right? He argues that we, he means Anglo-Saxons, are the finest race in the world, and the more the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race, right? So there's humans as a, as a group, but we Anglo-Saxons, we British white humans, are better than everyone else. So the more of the world we control, the better, right? How good it would be if we take over uh, the world from these despicable specimens of human beings, that's actually good for them, right? So social Darwinism justifies taking over other people's territory by saying it's actually good for them, right? Because we're racially superior, biologically superior. It's good that we take that territory. It will help us. It will help them. Um, I emphasize how this was challenged, though, by the battles of Islan Douana and Ottawa. Um, and the question was, you know, how does this challenge it? Why were Africans able to win these battles? So we talked about this guy, Shaka Zulu, who is going to form, through his military advances, is able to form a powerful state. Remember, he had that horns of the bull uh, formation uh, that allowed him to encircle his enemies. And even though he's going to be assassinated, he was so good at building a government that it continued to exist after him. Right, that's, you know when you did a good job, right? Chin Emperor falls apart when he dies. This guy, his state continues. And he will defeat British forces at the Battle of Islan Douana. He, his, I'm sorry, he won't. His, his descendants will. The Zulus will. Um, the problem, though, is that the British will eventually win the war, right? Because they have an industrial economy. But what I wanted to emphasize was using this traditional horns of the bull technique and just armed with only spears and um, shields, the Zulus were so disciplined and so brave and had such a good military tactic that they were able to close with the British and utterly destroy their army in this battle. 
right? So Africans were capable of winning. It's just because they had not undergone the Industrial Revolution, they weren't able necessarily to follow up a battle with a victory in a war. Now, another example that we had was uh, this Battle of Adwa, right? In the Battle of Adwa, this is when Italy invaded o Ethiopia, an ancient African state going back, you know, like 1,800 years or so, or more like 1,500 years, very long. Um, remember, in this state claimed descent from uh, Solomon. Uh, they said Solomon and the Queen of Sheba had a child, and that was their, their, their first king, or one of their kings. Now, the Ethiopians won this battle, I mean, partially, and they won the war because they won the battle so decisively. Part of it was because they outnumbered the Italians four to one, but I want to emphasize they also had modern weapons, and they knew how to use them. So Africans were capable of using modern weapons in war, right? They, they understood how these things worked. And that combined with this being an old state with a very long history in which Ethiopians believed very strongly in Ethiopia and their king, they were willing to fight hard in order to win this battle, which was so decisive that they won the entire war. Okay, we had this, I just want to check. Okay, we had this question, what was indirect rule? What was direct rule? Why might Europeans practice these forms of rule? Why might native peoples accuse, accept or put up with them? Why might they resist? So remember, indirect rule, uh, you had this problem with empire. Do you rule directly or indirectly through traditional rulers, right? Abina and the important men had both, right? Remember, in Abina and the important men, they had both. There were people who ruled directly, uh, like William Brew, and then there were people who um, ruled indirectly, like how the British worked through the important men. Um, in France, they tended to focus on direct rule. And there was this question, do we accept things the way they are? Or do we try and make the Africans uh, become like Europeans? Do we try and make Africans in, in French-controlled Africa become French? Do we try to make the Africans where the British control that part of Africa, do we try and make them British? The French in Africa, uh, modern-day Senegal, chose to take an approach of direct rule and assimilation. I gave you this example of Blaise Diagne. Blaise Diagne learns French and French culture and actually becomes... He goes from being a member of the local colonial assembly to a member of the French parliament, the national assembly, where he will pass laws that govern French people, like people, white people in France. So the French were very serious about this, right? This African had learned what uh, French civilization, had learned how to speak French, and so he was treated not simply as an equal, but as someone who could help govern France itself because he had assimilated. And he supported the French mission of civilization, right? Blaise Diagne was all for uh, Africans adopting, he didn't mean that they should adopt it 100%, but adopting the elements of French civilization they liked. Now others will resist, right? Blaise Diagne is one African example, but others would resist, right? They would say, why should we change? Africa is just fine the way it is. And others would say, even if we admire Western civilization, we don't want to be a colony because colonies are badly treated. We want to be free. No questions there. So that then 